When I was looking at my wife's embroidery machine working, which is a massively hypnotic thing, I was wondering how I'd go about recreating those embroidery patterns in Houdini. And my main concern with that was how I would art direct where these stitches would go into which direction so which kind of flow they would have. And then it hit me that I could do this with a volume. So here's my attempt at embroidery in Houdini. Let's drop down a geo, delete the file, and start out with a grid. Let's set his orientation to XY plane. And what worked for me was a size of 0.45 and 0.675. Don't worry about those numbers, it's just they matched up with my setup and my image sizes. So the image that I prepared requires us to have 750 rows and 500 columns. And those just roughly match my image resolution that I have. Next, let's add a UV to that with the UV texture node, set the projection axis to the Z axis, and orthographic is fine. Let's just write the attribute on the points, wire this in here, and then attach an attribute from map. So we're gonna load up our image here, which I prepared, which is this nice bird called a bee eater, which I have from an open source book. Next, let's also load up an alpha map using the same attribute from Mapsop, wire this in here, and I also prepared a bee eater alpha. Highlight this here, and we don't wanna write this onto a CD, but let's create another attribute called alpha. And we just wanna use the alpha to delete all the points, which are black. I'm gonna use a point triangle for this, wire this in here, and I will compare if the average of my alpha color is below, say, 80%, 0.8, and if it is so, so if it is darker than 80%, let's remove the given point, that is, the point with the current point number, like so. Highlight this, and that totally worked better than expected. That's, of course, because I misspelled alpha like so. Next, I'm gonna scatter points onto this geometry here using the scatter sop, line it up, setting relax iterations to 12 and force a total count of 15,000. And I also fumble around with the global seed. So we end up with something like this. Lots of points scattered on the geometry and they also already have the bird's color. So now how do we turn those points into stitches? Well, Simply put, we would like to use a volume trail with a volume that drives in which direction the stitches run. So let's create that. Drop down a volume here, increase the sampling distance to 200, and it's got a size of one by one by, say, 0.2. Let's just ghost this here. Yeah, so my whole bird is within this volume. It will be a vector volume called vel for velocity. And I will use this vector called velocity to store the general direction in which the stitches will be running. And the way I'll determine this direction is just manually by drawing in some guide splines. So I'll drop down a curve here, go to the tool handle, and then just kind of draw in a rough overall spline of the direction that these stitches should take. Like so, hit enter to accept and maybe move this point outward a bit, like so. However, this curve is really rough here and also it's not really flat. So the first thing I'm gonna do is drop down a transform and scale it down along its Z axis to flatten it, like so. And then drop down a resample, set this to subdivision curves, wire it up and also decrease the average point length. And now I have this resampled spline here. So this will drive the general direction of my stitches. And how am I gonna do this? Well, turns out my resample node here has an option to output a tangent attribute called tangent u by default. And let's visualize this by right clicking on the visualizers here and adding another scene visualizer. And we'd like to add a marker. Let's use a vector marker, scale down the length of it a bit and show arrow tips. And we would like to visualize the tangent u. Close, deactivate and activate it. And we can see now we have the tangents of this spline. And it's these tangents that I'd like to use to really define the direction in which the stitches will be running. So how do I write those tangents into my volume? Well, with the help of a volume wrangle. I'm gonna drop that down here, wire up my volume in the slot one and my curve containing the tangents in the slot number two. Disable this visualization shortly. And in my volume, I just wanna find the nearest point to the voxel I'm just working on. And then from that nearest point, get the tangent value and write it into my voxel. So first I'm gonna find the closest points to my current voxel. So int npt for near point equals near point. And we'd like to look up the nearest point coming in through this slot here, 
So the second slot has the ID of one. And we'd like to look for the closest point from our current voxel position, that's V at P. Next, let's load this found points. Next, let's load this closest points tangent by creating a vector, let's call it M10 for nearest tangent. And that is the point attribute on points coming in through slot one. The point attribute's name is tangent U and the point number is the NPT. And now finally, let's write this vector that we loaded here into our volume. So V at vel equals N10, that's it. Now my volume should store all those tangent values. Looks a bit weird, but we should be good. Let's check this by dropping down a volume trail. Wire up my scatter points in here. Let's dial the step length down to one and wire the volume in here and highlight it. And we can see now, let's uncheck visualize velocity, that we have these small trails here that already give a good approximation to what stitches look like. And what I did in the volume trail, I decreased the trail length to be 0.015 and increased the CFL to five like this. So I have those stitches running there now. And you can see, I kind of combed them now, really similar to what the hair tools do. However, their color does not seem right because it seems to fade here over the length of the trail. So let's fix that by first resetting the color of all those points to white. And then just copying this attrib from map up here, pasting it down there, and rewiring this in here, highlight it. So now that I've rewritten those colors onto the points, let's just take care of those gradients in here by using an attrib promote and I will promote my color diffuse from point to primitive. And of course I can use as many guide splines as I'd like here. I think I will need some additional ones for this bird. So what I do here is copy this curve sub, add some additional splines, merge them together, and then feed them through this whole chain. However, for now, this should be good. And in order to make this a bit more convincing, let's reduce its color depth because in embroidery, you usually have a limited number of yarn colors and not like the full 16 million colors we have in this image. So let's reduce it to say six, seven or eight colors. And we're gonna use the cluster sub for that. So I wanna build seven clusters, that's four, seven colors. Let's not use the position, but cluster the color, CD, 50 iterations, that's fine. I ended up using a seed of three in my example. And let's wire this up. And what this does is it gives me an error. That is because my attribute is not on a point, but on a primitive here. So let's promote it back using an attrib promote again, wire this in here from primitive to point. And the attributes name is CD. So now my clustering works. So when I go into my geometry spreadsheet here, I now have an attribute called cluster, which ranges from six to zero or from zero to six which for each color gives me a certain ID. But what is the color of this ID? Well, let's use a second cluster sub to find out. Just copy this over here and let's check output cluster centers. And what that does is it reduces our point count to seven individual points with their respective cluster ID and this cluster ID's mean color. So let's use a point wrangle to write back those seven individual colors onto our main geometry stream. Drop down a point wrangle here, wire in both geo streams. And in my point wrangle, I just wanna look up a color. So color vector call for color equals a point attribute coming in through the second slot here, ID one. And the value that I'd like to look up is called CD. And the point ID equals the cluster ID of my current point. So that's just I at cluster. And now that I loaded this color, I just wanna write it out to my current point color like so. Let's highlight it. And I see now before and after. I reduced the colors of those strands here. Oh, and by the way, I have to make sure that the settings on both cluster subs are identical. So let's just copy this parameter here and paste it as a relative reference in here. So what I can do now is dial in the seed to see if that changes or shifts my color values. And it does a tiny bit, but not really. So yeah, set this back to three and maybe increase slash decrease our color numbers here. So you can play around with that. Okay, time to save this. And next, let's take care of the shape of our stitches because now they're just plain flat, which stitches in an embroidery are usually not. They have this slightly curved shape to them. So when I look at them from the side, they are just perfectly flat. Let's just highlight the point display and zoom in a bit. And we can see that each stitch is just aligned with two endpoints. So let's first resample those lines. Wire this in here and check maximum segments. Let's set them to 12. 
highlight it and we can see now we have uniformly resampled curves with 12 segments. So let's write a bit of VEX code to lift up those curves and shape them. In a primitive wrangle, what we will do for each primitive, we will get the primitive's points. So this will store the primitive's points and we're gonna get them with a print points function coming in through the GeoStream zero and on our current primitive number. And we will need to know how many points are in there. Let's call this max PT and it's equal to the length of that array and we will use this variable to remap the point position along the spline from zero at the beginning of the spline to one to the end of the spline and thus we have to subtract one to match the boundary conditions. Next we'll just initialize a counting variable float called n which will initialize to zero and now we'll just create a for each loop so we will run over each of those points in the spline so for each point in the array in PTS we will do this. We will read out each individual point's position. Let's call it pause. And it's coming into our first input slot. It's called P and the point number is NPT. And now we'll create a ramp to set this point's Z position. That's how much is lifted from the fabric holding the embroidered pattern. So let's create a float called Z and that is equal to a ramp. And let's call this ramp lift. And the parameter going into it from 0 to 1 is our current counting variable. So how many times this for each loop has already executed divided by the maximum point number, max PT. And after we've done that, let's calculate the new position. So position equals position minus a vector that we're going to create. And it's 0 on the x-axis, 0 on the y-axis, and z, that's the offset we just calculated on the z-axis. Now let's finally set the new point position, write that back onto our point, like so, and finally increase our counting variable. Let's keep our fingers crossed and create our ramp slider here, highlight this, and we see that worked better than expected. Okay, let's first dial in this ramp here. So we want points to be lifted in the center, and we want them not lifted at both ends still a bit too strong so let's maybe introduce a multiplier in here so up here where i calculate the offset let's add a float slider which we're going to call amp create the slider here and dial it in to be something like 0 0.05 maybe uh, still a bit strong more like this and let's not make this triangular but set it to be a b-spline add another point and thus dial in the overall shape of those stitches, something like that. What I can also do now is add a bit of randomness. So let's multiply this with a random number, which would derive from the primitive number plus a seed. Let's call the usual one, two, three, four. You see now that these have a different height. So that is the general embroidery setup. What I'd have to do now is add secondary details, like for example, coils in the yarn that we used because the yarn is always twisted, which is a method that Manu already used in the knitting tutorial. You can of course tweak all these parameters down here, maybe add or remap the randomness a bit, and of course add more guide splines to guide the direction of these yarns, for example, down here or in the area around the eye or around the bird's wings here to give a bit more detail to the whole embroidery setup. But in general, this is the basic skeleton of a setup. This is what we do. So we scatter points on a grid and advect them with a volume trail through a velocity volume that we build by drawing guide splines, calculating their tangents, and then in the volume, just stealing the tangents of the closest points. In essence, what we built here is not that different from a hair grooming setup, just that we applied it to drive the direction of embroidery stitches. So as always, I hope you're having fun with this technique. We are always eager to see the artworks you guys come up with. And I'd like to thank you for sticking around. And a special thank you goes out to our patrons, especially Mohammed Al-Abri, David Aiden, Momomiya Ishigo, and Joseph Howerton. Thank you guys. Cheers, and see you soon.